I'm Tamika D. Mallory. And it's your boy, my son, the general. We are your host of TMI. Tamika and my son's information, truth, motivation, and inspiration. New name, new energy, but same o us. <laughs> <laughs> What's good, my son, Lennon? Ah, uh, you know, life. Life be life and so I'm just putting up with it. <laughs> it's crazy. Like the my thoughts about what we would discuss today is so different from last week to what is going on in the world today. It's really just everything, every America is like the gift that keeps on giving, but you know, I don't know, I don't know about the gifts, but it gives all the time. Yeah, America's very strange, man. I just try to find the little joy man, that I can, you know, my, my son won his championship. Shout out to Keston. You know, um, he plays with the Red Bulls um, young team and they had a tournament this weekend that was draining. It was like a hundred degrees out there. I don't even know how those kids play in these soccer games, but um, they was undefeated. They, they look like a professional team out there. So I want to shout out them. Shout out all the, the soccer parents who are out there cheering and, you know, doing what we do. So it, it was a dope event, you know, just watching him, just seeing him just grow. Like when you, you know, when you when you play sports, because I play sports my whole life and I played um basketball and you don't you don't really see or you don't know how you in you know, how you get him better. But I'm just watching him like. He started at five years old and he's now 10. And for the last five years, just watching him grow and his skill level just increase so much because he lo he really loves the sport. So just shout out to him man, and shout out to the team. So that's where I, I find my joy in this stuff. And then you got to come back to the real world where all of the, you know, the nonsense is happening. It's just like, Lord have mercy. We can't get, we can't get a broke, a break, man. Yeah, no, I mean, this. It's a lot, put it that way. But I also had a great um, weekend of spending time with my family. It was my family reunion. I have terrible allergies that I'm dealing with as a result of being in that, whatever they call it. I mean, the the heat in Alabama, and I know it was hot everywhere across the country, um, but the heat in Alabama was like nothing I've ever felt in my life before, especially as I was leaving on the last day. It was the hottest day. And oh man, I mean, you couldn't even stand outside to put your suitcase in the car without sweating all over. It was so hot, but it was hot and it was fun. We had a great time. My family, every two years we get together. You know, I, I, I noticed, I was just thinking like how important it is to try to bring family together. I noticed that in my family, like all the, the generations, even the little kids are excited because they know they're going to get an award for who graduated and, you know, who's done this and that and the best, uh, you know, reading scores and whatever. And I think it's so important, like if we don't reward our children and let them feel like they are, um, like they're being celebrated from their family and from their community. That's like, where do they go? So I love that about my family reunion. Every two years we get together in a different state. It moves around. Uh, and it and that also gives a young person or a person period who may not ever go out of town anywhere, the opportunity to, you know, get to go out and see things that's happening in the world. So I'd be happy about it. I get really, really excited and I make it a priority, but yes, hot is an understatement in terms of what's going, been going on. But let me get to my thought of the day. So this is a topic that I think some people will, you know, people always coming after me like, oh, we have to, you know, be careful what we say right now because, you know, we don't, we don't want to, <clears throat> excuse me, we don't want to offer Donald Trump any chips. And I get that. So, of course, you know, I'm a, I'm anti-Trump becoming president all the way, 100%. But, you know, something has been giving me like a cringy feeling. And I wanted to make it my thought of the day for others and for you to chime in. I keep seeing people say that Donald Trump is a convicted felon. And 
they are like using it as you know it's like it's like it's like when they say it they're saying it with a certain level of disdain right and granted his charges his his um his consistent consistent illegal activity that has been going on before he even ran for president this is stuff that people didn't necessarily know but it's been uncovered the lies um and and his racist behavior um and just it just his his what i'm looking for the right word criminal activity period he's just that's it i mean it's so clear and so I understand, I completely understand that in his case or in the case of uh, uh, Donald Trump, when people say he's a convicted felon, they're really speaking to the rape charges and, you know, the colossal, if you will, of findings by the courts, jury of his peers and others who know that he has been criminal mind, criminal activity for a long time. Got it. But there is something about me hearing people say, oh, if you want a convicted felon to be your president, uh, you know, he's a convicted felon and it's being used a certain way that just gives me a cringy feeling because I don't ever want us to get into the habit of looking at people who have felonies, right? Everybody who has a felony and being able to say, they are not qualified for X, Y, Z thing because they have a felony. So mm -hmm. I was trying to figure out how to balance those two conversations because I understand all the dangers of Donald Trump. I understand that he should not become president again of the United States. I understand how dangerous, problematic, and the type of energy that he brings up in the country, the type of energy that he creates, the toxicness of his, his participation in the society that we live in, being on TV, throwing out there, you know, just constantly, every time you hear from him, there's something that he says that absolutely 100% make, lets me know and, and reminds me and confirms for me that this man is not fit to be president. So I get that. And I also understand those people who say, well, in addition to that, we if you have a felony and you can still run for president, then we need to look at the laws that act everyday people live under and how their lives are being impacted by having a felony conviction, right? So I think that those things are very clear. Donald Trump, dangerous, bad for the country as far as I'm concerned. And if you are a convicted felon, and Donald Trump has one set of rules, then there should be the same rules for others. And in fact, we need to look at, we need to review how people living with felonies are existing in the world in general, because we know that there is the, the what is it, the collateral consequences that our brother Jay Jordan talks about to a person coming home with a felony. So that's, that's those things I understand, but I still cringe when I see certain people, especially white folks, writing convicted felon, convicted felon, because I feel like that does not just stop at Donald Trump and all the truths around him. It extends to a community of people who, to be quite clear, I would prefer to have some of my friends that have felonies to lead me any day over certain people who have none, no felony, and I don't trust them. So I just... You know, I know that for some people, it's kind of like, what the fuck are you talking about? Because you know what, you know why we're saying what we're saying. But I still feel a little cringy when I hear it. And I understand, you know, and, you know, being a convicted felon, you know, I, I, I'm definitely advocating for um, rehabilitation, right? For the opportunity to show that I can be a productive member of society. I think it's about actions, right? I think it's, it's less about words than actions. I think in in Donald Trump's situation is 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 multifaceted, right? We when we talk about him being a convicted felon, there's never been any rehabil rehabilitation or retribution from Donald Trump. 
he's consistently had a lifestyle in a way in which he lived his life that is criminal, right? That's that's who he is. So when people say he's a convicted felon, and he just got convicted yesterday, right? So what has he done to show that, okay, I, I just got convicted of a crime yesterday that I did three or four years ago, and I'm still living the same way. So when, we, when we're sitting there having this conversation about Donald Trump, it's not like the average person who has sat and done their time in prison. And during them, them, them doing their time in prison, you've seen them grow. You've watched the evolution of that individual. They've written books. They've, they've um, created programs within the prison system. For 10 years straight, they lived their lives in a different manner outside of the criminal activity that they was convicted of, right? So they, they, they're they showing you that they want to be rehabilitated. They have been rehabilitated and they want to be a productive member of society. So I think both of those things are right. I think, yeah, we, we need to also look at, you know, how these collateral damages affect felons and people who who have been convicted of, of crimes if we're going to say that what Donald Trump did is okay and he can still run for president. If you can run for the highest position in the land but you can't be a barber right but you can't but you can't um help at the basketball at the school right you can't do none of these things but you can run for where you can get the codes to the bombs and you can you can wage world war you can do anything you want to you can rewrite the constitution you can put justices in office right when you you telling me that you can do all those things as a is as not just a felon but a recently convicted individual of crimes, right? Where your whole cabinet, pretty much everybody who ran in your cabinet, who was a part of your administration is locked up, right? You you use the presidency as a criminal enterprise. Like this, your RICO charges stem from being the president. Actually in New York, what he was found guilty of is like inflating his business numbers and his work, his net worth or his value rather. Uh, so mm -hmm. that he can get loans and all that. He's been doing that for uh, decades now. You know what I'm saying? So these are continuous crimes. And that's the point that I'm making. It's a it's a hard person to choose to make the point on, right? Because it's Donald Trump. And we already know, again, this man is a, cr he's criminal minds, like the TV show, right? He, like you said, that was the word I was looking for, a lifestyle of crime and racism, right? So I already, I understand that. What I'm saying though, is that when I hear people or I see people, especially white folks writing, I don't want a convicted felon as my president, you know, convicted felon this and convicted felon that. I just feel a little bit of cringiness because if that applies to a white man, then it makes me feel like it's very possible that it could also apply to black folks, brown folks, and other but people. The problem is it's and been it, applied to and, us. and it does. And it it's does. And that's, and that's, that's, and that's what, what yeah, that's for my thing is like I came home from prison and I couldn't even travel. I was on I came home from prison from a crime that I was convicted that supposedly happened, you know, in 1997, in 2006. Right. And I wasn't able to travel and do just do life. I wasn't able to travel to, to, to do business. I wasn't able to get my life back on. You look at BG. BG was convicted of a crime years ago, spent, spent about 13 years in prison to come home to them to tell him that he can't even go perform, that they, right. they got to look at the songs. He writes. So this is what I'm trying to tell. Look at Meek Mill. He was on on paper for 11 years for a crime that he committed as, as a, a teenager. So these these collateral damages have all altered a bunch of our lives. So how can somebody who just got convicted of a crime just be able to go to the highest court of the land and be, a, I mean, the highest position in the land and be able to write laws and write into um, practice? But he doesn't write laws. He won't oh, well, write he can, he, Not really he write. Help to get laws he can influence. He, he has the influence. ability to influence the laws that can pretty much wipe out what he did wrong. And he can influence it to say that well, no. He did it with the Supreme Court. He did yeah, it. I mean, they, they now have made the decision that if he if if his actions were committed as president, then more than likely they are not seen as illegal. And you know, it is permitted or permissible. And you know, and and I think that the bottom line to 
what I was thinking is that there has to be a, like America in and of itself, the layers have to be pulled open at some point in order for us to continue. We can't keep like sweeping all of these things up, trying to push it in the corner, stick it under the rug, put it in the closet so people can come by and see us and think we're so beautiful and great. It is absolutely a country that I love. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure that you have parts about this country that you love as well, right? But there is some deep rooted stuff that has not been addressed that we have to get to the heart of. Because again, when I listen to people talk about Donald Trump being a convicted felon, right? And them not wanting him to be president. What I understand is that what they're saying is 100% right. But I also know that there are people who don't want Pookie to get a job because he's a convicted felon. And I want to say said it. And that's that's what the thing is for me. And I, I want to know what the standards are. I want to I'm hoping that this opens up an opportunity to look at the standards that we're holding, because if one is true, which is like you said, Pookie's always been impacted and unable to work and unable. But here is a man that people are having to try to use the fact that he's a convicted felon as a way to deter folks from voting for him. Right. That's that's what they're trying to use. And meanwhile, he just was a bad president. So listen, everyone, uh, today we are interrupting our entire show, our reg regularly scheduled programming to bring a guest that is so important to us, someone who is a friend, uh, a friend to us personally, a friend to TMI. Uh, the last time he was on, we were street politicians uh, and he's here now under our new branding, uh, but also a friend to the community, a friend to the people. And you all know him from your TV screens over many, 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 many years. His, uh, his, his track record, and uh, his portfolio is extensive. And so you can go and do all the research and the reminders on the Great Hill Harper and all of the entertainment that he's brought us over the years, serious entertainment, real entertainment, fun entertainment. But what he's doing right now is not entertainment. It is serious. And uh, we want to make sure that all of our listeners at every part of this country that you are aware the Hill Harper is a candidate for United States Senate, um, but especially if you are in the state of Michigan, it is important that you all know that your vote is necessary. I believe it's 1st of August, I think it's August 6th, but we're going to hear that directly from, um, from uh, Hill in a moment. Uh, there is a lot on, at stake in this election, and there are a lot of big money interest groups that are attempting to snuff out the will of the people and to stop us from being able to put people in office that we have all said very clearly, we want to see leading this country. We are trying to go in a new direction, but as we work hard to turn the tides, there are people who will work just as hard, if not harder, to turn it back or to keep it um, in a way that is not beneficial to our communities. And so today, as I said, we've interrupted our entire show to bring Hill Harper on and allow him to talk about what's happening in his race um, and just why is this even important? Why even run for Senate knowing that there would be so much, so much to come against him as he attempts to, uh, to, to become the United States Senator from Michigan. So, Hill Harper, thank you so very much for joining TMI today. We appreciate you so much, and it's good to see you. Thank you both for having me on. This, th these types of conversations are so important, and it's so important to spread the word. So you uh, offering this platform for us to have this discussion is, is huge. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Hill. I just want to know, you know, just being a fan of yours and um, just watching you as a uh, artist as a actor and just and just knowing you you know a lot more personal i want to know what made you take the leap from mm -hmm. that to this 
You know, um, so many people are hurting. And, 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 and you're talking about in every level, I mean, almost every category, particularly when it comes to communities that have experienced generational poverty, uh, undereducation, hyper mass incarceration, um, violence, uh, 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 you know, crime, et cetera, all of the ills that we talk about, it's getting worse. And, and, and folks know and can feel that there's a fix in, that, that, it's, that, that they don't have a partner in government that's actually helping. Mm -hmm. And so when we think about the United States Senate, it is the most powerful deliberative body in the world. Um, mm -hmm. It determines the distribution annually. 100, this, think about this, 100 people in this country determine how $7.2 trillion are allocated annually. And, and, and folks don't break it down like that. The Senate is the most powerful body in all of politics. The president does not decide where the money goes. Let, let's be very clear about this. And so if we want to start to get resources back to our communities that have been really beaten down, traumatized, choked out from multiple levels, we have to have a seat at the table. I mean, Shirley Chisholm said, if you don't have a seat at the table, bring a folding chair. Why? Because you have to have a seat at the table. And, and we haven't. We've only had 12 black senators in over 250 years. Um, if we had 12 right now, we still would be underrepresented. So, so you know, attempting to become the 13th black senator in the history of this country um, is something that's vitally important, particularly now, given that we're, we're a decade and a half into what we're seeing happen with Citizens United. Citizens United, for those who are listening, just understand, many people think that the reaction to the Obama presidency was the Tea Party. I personally believe the reaction to the Obama presidency was, was Citizens United, which allows for unfettered, unlimited dark money to come into our politics. And, and you know, we can talk about we can talk about all of that. But the point is, is that if we don't get seats at the table in, in bodies like the U.S. Senate, things are going to continue to get worse as we're seeing we're seeing that happen. And so this is an open U.S. Senate seat in Michigan, the first truly open Senate seat in 24 years. And so this is a this may not come again in our lifetime. So this was the time to do it. It's the time to represent folks. It's the time that common sense, good people have to run for office. If we keep get, letting letting crazies uh, occupy these seats, we're going to continue to get these crazy uh, outcomes that we're seeing. Absolutely. Tell, tell me, uh, what are some of the major issues that you see in the state of Michigan? Um, and, you know, our audience, and I know there's a lot of issues and you are obviously well versed in many of the different types of the diversity of issues and challenges. But our folks that are listening here are mainly black and brown people. Um, and right. we, also, we also have a high concentration of Black men who follow my son, who listen to my son. I want to know what are some of the issues that really are concerning to you that made you say, I need to do this because I see my people? Absolutely. Well, so first of all, let's just say, I want folks to be very clear. Um, the United States Senate is a federal seat. So anything I'm able to pass will apply to folks no matter where you are federally, uh, equally as far as Michigan. So I see this seat as a as a national seat, um, to be to be quite clear, this is about national representation, and 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 yes, I will be the senator from Michigan and focused on issues relating to Michiganders, but that applies to everybody when we pass something federally. And so, so when we talk about issues, number one, um, health care, uh, we we have a health care crisis, particularly in our community. When we talk about high blood pressure, heart disease, when we talk about the impact of COVID in our community, we talk about the, the fact that that there are many of our communities are experiencing food apartheid. Uh, some people refer to it as a food desert, but I choose to use the other word because I believe it's systemic and not naturally occurring. When we talk about the fact that uh, we are living in a time when resources are being pulled out of our community, we have. Uh, mass incarceration. So what are the things that we'll want to do? We want to provide uh, universal health care. If you get sick, you deserve to see a doctor right now. Uh, mental health care, vision, dental, all of these included. We also want to reduce mass incarceration. And, and how do you do that? You do that in multiple ways. Number one, the greatest investment and most efficient investment any government can make is spending on early childhood education and child care, et cetera, right? It pays you back $8 on the backside for every dollar you spend on the front side. We also know that there's a clear tie between education rates, educa education 
um, achievement and incarceration rates, right? We, we know that it's there. So we're 5% of the world's population. We hold 25% of the world's incarcerated peoples. Uh, it's not right and it needs to be addressed and we have to do that. Michigan is the epicenter for taking money out of public education. We understand in Michigan alone uh, $4 billion underspent on public education in part because of the DeVos family and, and the history that they were. And so um, they're out of the west side of the state where I am right now. Uh, Grand Rapids. And so when we talk about these issues, we, we can go down to violence and common sense gun laws and wanting to make sure I was just at the corner of Reno and, and Rossini on the east side of Detroit, where two young people were killed this past week, 19 people shot. Um, it was a mass shooting that happened on the east side of Detroit, two blocks from, you know, I did a, a block party, uh, came to a block party on the east side for 4-2 Doug. 4-2 Doug asked me to come over there, meet with the people. I was talking to three, 400 young men and none of whom were planning on voting until I spoke with them and we, I broke down why it was so important. And it blew me away um, how so many of these young men, even one young guy said to me, and I'll tell you, I got emotional. He said, man, um, I don't wanna feel stupid. I said, what do you mean? You gonna feel stupid? He said, man, when I get in there, I'm not gonna know uh, what names to write or how to spell them. Mm. And I, I was like, man, no one's ever showed you a ballot? Mm. He's like, no. I said, man, it's just like when you take a standardized test, you just fill in a bubble. Mm. He's like, for real? And I was like, yeah, man. And, and I, felt like I had to, I had to question my assumptions because I'm mm. like, we're we're asking people to vote, and we've never even taught them how to vote. How how does that make sense? And so, yeah, oh, you know, it's so frustrating. No one, no one's gonna walk into some some clerk's office not even knowing what to do. When, so right. we have to check all of our assumptions about this and, and, and communicate to folks about why this matters. And so at the end of the day, investment in community, letting entrepreneurs get capital so they can create businesses in our neighborhoods, in our communities. Detroit is an epicenter for uh, right now a ton of investment downtown, but the neighborhoods and the communities complete underinvestment when folks want to open up businesses. So capital flow, I'm a small business owner. Um, all of these things, raising the minimum wage, um, all of these things to, to a living wage, all of these things are a part of it. And um, we, we, we can do this work, but we need representation to do it. You've always been a motivation. You know, you're a cancer survivor. You know, you uh, a father. You adopted a son. And, and, and we right now, the political climate is very heavy. You know, and what do you think that you can do to motivate and inspire to, to, to kind of like bridge the gap? In, in, in what's going on right now. We, we, we got to remind each other of our power. Mm. And that's critical. Um, if we actually showed up as an organized community, and certainly in the state of Michigan and across the country, we can control the outcome of almost every election and put people in office that uh, will represent our, our community's interests. The thing is, is that we've been convinced that we don't have the power and we also don't have the systems in place to organize turnout. And, and as an example, um, the last Democratic primary in Michigan, uh, African-American turnout was less than 10 percent. If African-American turnout on August 6th for my race is less than 10 percent, I will not win. Mm. It's, it's, it's just it, it's impossible. But if we just ratchet that up to 20 25 percent, meaning right. two and a half out of 10. I'm not we're not talking like incredible numbers. Right. Two and a half people out of 10 voted. I win. Imagine that we got to understand our power, understand how powerful we are. And, 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 and it doesn't take, you know, during the Coleman Young years in, in, in Detroit, turnout was like 60 percent. At 60 percent, we would control everything. And then therefore, everyone would have to come through our community to make decisions. Right now, people aren't truly checking with us and they're not coming through our community because we we haven't uh, we haven't exercised our muscle and we can do that. Um, and, and but that's I mean, a lot of factors go into that. And, and so part of its education, part of I blame the Democratic Party, to be quite honest, because they do not do. They don't spend GOTV money for primaries because the establishment wants to pick the winner. And then they want to flood our community with tons of tons of money to say, get out and vote and save the country. And so um, we have to understand that that's that's the fix that's going on, even within the party. And then the way we get the power is to 
is to win. If we don't win, if we don't start winning elections, we'll never have the power at, at, at the end of the day. And we can right. talk about it all we want. We can be angry about it. But winning is what dictates uh, our voice and power. So, you know, there are people who will be like, this guy was on TV. This is a gimmick. He's an actor. How all of a sudden did he transition into politics? Because, they, you know, you know, sometimes we can be a little skeptical. But I want people to know, sure. first of all, you had a successful career in law as well. And you were a union organizer, weren't you? That's right. I was right. elected to the National Board of my union where right. I fought for fair contracts, negotiated contracts against the executives. I, uh, you know, I was appointed by President Obama to the President's Cancer Panel where we worked the National Institute of Health making recommendations for cancer funding and research. You know, I mean, I, I was the National Spokesperson for the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law where we did voter protection work. I was National Spokesperson for the the unfair way to raise the minimum wage, $15 an hour floor, you know, the, the, the work, the receipts are there, but it, but that doesn't even matter. I mean, you know, that, that at the end of the day, it's it's about what are you willing to fight for? Mm -hmm. And I think that what in this moment, um, we can be sometimes our own worst enemy. It's like, you know, we want, it's, it, I, all I say is this, I say to people, listen, just look at my opponent. You don't even need to like me. Just look right. at, I'm running against somebody who didn't co-sponsor George Floyd Justice and Policing. I'm running against somebody who didn't co-sponsor Cannabis and Expungement Act. I'm running against somebody who didn't co-sponsor co Medicare for All. I'm running against somebody who who uh, who who just two, uh, ten days ago voted to not fund the State Department to uh, confirm and and uh, the uh, Gaza Health Ministry's death and injury injury totals. And the week before that, voted uh, in favor of sanctioning. Uh, the 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 uh, ICC when they call Netanyahu's actions a uh, war crimes and crimes against humanity. She's funded by APAC. I'm not taking one cent from APAC. I'm mm -hmm. not taking one cent in corporate PAC money. At the end of the day, you don't even need to like me. Just do research on my opponent and decide who who would you like to be in the U.S. Senate. That's mm -hmm. what I said. Mm, a lot of times, the information that we know, a lot of people don't understand. So unless they listen to programs like this, because the media is often it's very difficult to get a clear, full, true examination of all the facts and everything that's happening. And because so many in the media uh, support, whether they want to or not, the war or the attack on Gaza, they will never really explain how serious it is that, like you said, the ICC, which is supposed to be an independent body, which is supposed to have the power to sanction those that they feel are committing a crime. And in this particular moment, they are attempting to do that. And there are people who are elected officials. So we got black folks, brown folks and others who say we want to see a ceasefire immediately. We That's need right. to be able to draw the connection between those people who are working in the opposite direction and people like you who have been willing to one call for a ceasefire, which is not an easy thing to do in this political climate. And then also to, to put or to, I want to say, put your money where your mouth is, but it's really the other way around is to not take money from people. That's right. Who who would who would hope who would therefore try to influence you to support something that you have been so um you know clearly against so i'm, I'm i mean just... to your to your point the the, the same organization that d just took jamal bowman out and spent 20 million dollars to do that they offered me the same deal to try to target rashida to leave here in michigan and i said absolutely not they wanted me to drop out of the senate race and target rashida they offered 10 million in hard dollars and 10 million in dark dollars soft money and, and that's exactly what they spent to take out Jamal Bowman. They're trying to take out Corey Bush in the same way down in Missouri and, and Summer Lee, et cetera. And so, so know that this is real. Right. This, but the system is allowing it. Citizens United is allowing the system to be worked that way. And, and so if, 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 even if you think about who and what you support, just the fact that I'm not taking one cent from APAC, nor would I fall for their deal, that, that shows we got to have more, more folks that won't be bought won't be bossed, won't be bullied, right? Absolutely. So, Absolutely. I know that you man. have to go, my son, if, if you want to, because I want to ask one more question, but go ahead. Yeah, I want to ask one real quick. You know, we were just having a discussion prior to you coming on here about, you know, convicted felons and running for president, and we're talking about Donald Trump. I want to know, do you think 
as a convicted felon, he should be allowed to run for presidency and and a convicted sex offender. And and if so, what do you think a second Donald Trump presidency would mean, even if you were in Senate? Would you think it would empower you? Would you think that it would make it a lot harder for you? Like, what do you think? I I, I have to stay consistent. Uh, you know, I was just speaking in, in a jail in the Genesee County Jail on Thursday, talking to um, here in Michigan. If you're in jail awaiting trial, you can vote. Uh, if you have on probation, parole, you can vote felony conviction you vote so so, so wide open voting uh for for you know being involved in the system here and so um i don't believe conviction should ever inhibit you from participating fully in all things that are that that, that are in this country and i also believe that once you serve your time um that 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 your record should be sealed we should ban the box and and sure it can be uncovered if you know, if a future situation happens but at the end of the day once you've done your time no one has any business of what your history should be and so so that's my feeling about all of those things now, that's what i said a, that's what i said the free, okay good so so the the firewall has to be the us senate um you know and that's why being a senator uh we control the money you know the president can can sign executive orders and attempt to do things at the margins but at the end of the day, the United States Senate controls the budget. You know, the House of Representatives, all those House members, they send a bill to the Senate. The Senate can amend it, send it back, change the title, do all sorts of things. At the end of the day, 100 people control two really important things. The lifetime appointment of federal judges, and we see how that affects us every day, and then also how the money's gone. My grandma used to say, baby, follow the money. You want to know anything about somebody? Look at how they spend their money. Look at our country and how we spend our money. I'm not going to rubber stamp increases in the National Defense Authorization Act, even if the president wants to do that. So, so we have to have a firewall to fight back. And I would be able to fight back from the United States Senate. And that, to me, is the key. Um, we, we're going to fight and represent the values of the people who send me there and what, and what the history is. And so no matter who's in the presidency, I'm going to be fighting. I'm going to hold both parties accountable. I'm just to be honest with you. You know, both parties have, have been derelict in certain ways to our community. And so I'm going to be there um, um, holding both parties accountable for sure, no matter who who is in the executive branch. Um, you know, you, so, you, took, you took my next question and, and answered it. And that uh, is a testament to your brilliance and to your finger being on the pulse, because the question I was going to ask you is, will you be a Democratic, go get along to go along, whatever the Democrats say, what the president says, because, you know, that was one of the things that they used against Jamal Bowman. Um, and in fact, Jamal Bowman's election, what was that, Ju June 25th, I believe, June 25th, the same day I was in St. Louis, Missouri, sitting in a sports bar, looking at mm -hmm. seven screens above my head, and each one of them was, it was all sports news, some Latino, different languages. Every few minutes, the commercial that they ran in St. Louis was against Cori Bush with the same exact language that they used against Jamal Bowman. And the main point was that she does not, and of course that Jamal does, does not support the president has voted against the president. And it is harming us when our Democrats don't work with the president. And yet when you listen to uh, uh, Congressman Bowman and Congresswoman Bush explain what is loaded into these bills and how sometimes either you can lose things uh, that are important in our communities and sometimes there can be things in the bills that are harmful for our communities and therefore they have used their vote as leverage in the for the Democrats and Republicans and whoever else. So just as, as a final word on that and you can close it up, give us a bow tie on whether we can depend okay. on you to be a thinker and a person who will be for the people and not just for parties. Absolutely. Listen, the 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 the, the establishment doesn't want me in this seat. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because they know I'll be an independent thinker. They understand that I'm going to fight for people. I'm not going to fight. You know, remember the first three words of both the Michigan Constitution and the U.S. Constitution are saying "We the people." It doesn't say "We the party." It doesn't say "We the politician." It doesn't say "We the super PAC." doesn't say we the big donor, it says we the people. I'm going to fight for people, and that's why I'm running. And so that, at the end of the day, if, if something's coming down that doesn't fit for people, then I'm not going for it, and I won't do it. And so 
Um, you know, I hope folks will go to the website, hillharper.com and support. Two dollars makes a difference. We are we are trying to run ads. We're trying to get the word out to get people to vote. So many people don't even know what a, what a primary is. So we're having to educate our community about August 6th and the primary. There's nine days of early in-person voting, July 27th, August 4th. There's a, a, a absentee voting going on right now. And so this is the moment where we really need people's help. Dave Chappelle just helped me out a lot by doing a big fundraiser for me like this past Thursday uh, in Detroit, which was huge uh, because, you know, him to stand up and, and, you know, he's selling out arenas and for him to come and do something for me meant so much. And so any anybody, you know, I need both y'all to come on up. Uh, we, we need to do uh, during early voting. We need to do an we event. Do we, could, we could do the show live from Detroit or live from Grand Rapids. So just that. any help, folks, please, please, please. God bless you. Uh, on, and let's let's go. This is an opportunity that we can't miss. Thank you, Hill. We appreciate you, Hill. Thank Continue you. To be great. We got your back. And if you need us out there, then we coming. That's it. Thank you. I need you. Say less. Say less. Come on. I'm praying for Hill. You know, I'm praying for Hill. I'm I'm praying for Hill because I know from the years and years and years of being Hill's friend and seeing him in the world, that he really has a passion for Black folks. And he, he has everything that's necessary to lead. Like he really should absolutely be the senator. The problem, though, is that when I think about what happened to Jamal Bowman, and I think about how so many Black people lined up behind the white man, even though the white man is 100% a supporter of um you know Israel and look at what's happening right now and guess what these same black people claim that they don't that they want a ceasefire and they are against what's happening in Israel and yet they supported the candidate who would a hundred percent fund and back the assault on the people of Gaza. These are black folks. So I I I it, it gives me it takes away kind of uh, reduces my hope for Hill yeah. because I, I don't know about our people sometimes. I mean, unfortunately, all we can do is fight, man, and, and just stand on the right side of history, stand on the right side of morality and integrity, you know, and, and Hill has always represented that, you know, and I just believe that we just have to convince, they're, like he said, 20% of the people, if we get 20% right. of the people, and we know that two out of 10 people want the right candidate to be in office, right? We just got to make sure that they understand what's at stake. We got to make sure that they understand when it's time to go out to vote, you know? And, that, and that's what the opposition is is very um, good at doing. They're good at make, making their base understand that we need you to come out. We Making sure that their base knows when it's time to vote. You know, and, and we have we have not been all the time. We have not done that the best. So I think, you know, hopefully. Uh, yeah, and some people do, like Black Voters Matter, uh, Melanie Campbell and the National Coalition of Black Civic Participation. You got Mary Pat Hector and those that, you know, are down in Georgia. I mean, there are groups around the nation, but I understand what you're saying. The Republicans send out like a back call when they need, people to support them and then their people are and unfortunately not all republicans but so many of them are motivated by hate mm -hmm. and on on the, on the new thing is that they're doing they're not just the republicans are funding the democrats that lean republican now right, right. so it's not so that's what I'm saying they got a double strategy like they right. democrats is not funding saying yo we're going to get the best Republican person that you know that we can lean a little more. We're gonna put money behind them so that we, we on the same page. We we haven't, right. we haven't advanced our that's their new strategy now. Right. They're pretty much putting people in our party that yeah. that lean more towards them and they're funding. But it might not be new because how did Christian Cinema and Joe Manchin get there? Who are people who are older? I don't know how long Christian uh, Cinema was in the Senate, but I know Joe Manchin was around for a while. And so, you know, this is, this is a strategy they've probably been using for a long time. Not to mention when you think about somebody like APAC, APAC also funds 
both sides, right? So, you know, it it is a very, it's a strategy that they use. And I'm sure some people will listen to us and be like, oh, the Democrats do similar. Well, who? Just yeah, give me the name of right. the Republican that is constantly, or not so much constantly, but has a good track record of leaning in the more progressive direction or more of a liberal uh, direction. I don't know him. I don't know him either. I mean, in the end of his, you know, at, at the end of his time in um, office, I guess Mitt Romney became a little bit, because Mitt Romney was like one of those Republicans that's like, y'all, is MAGA is not my thing. I don't, mm -hmm. I'm not with MAGA. But I mean, when you look back over Mitt Romney's record, he also has some questionable shit. So it's like, I just don't know. I, I don't know. Anyway, moving right along. Moving right along, which brings me to my I don't get it. There was a um attempt on Donald Trump life a couple mm -hmm. days ago. And um there's a lot of speculation of why, who, this and that. You know what party did it? Who did it? You know, I've I've seen so many different things. I've heard so many different allegations. You know, and I I wrote on my page, you know, the day that it happened is that um you know unfortunately, you know this is a result. In my in my position, this is a result of the last eight years of the climate that the, the MAGA, the whole MAGA campaign has created, you know, the, 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 the level of intense and division. I haven't seen this much since slavery before, since before civil rights. And a lot of people say, Oh, America is, and I say, I'm not saying that it hasn't. I'm just saying to the level that I have seen it in the last eight years in my personal experience i've never had more encounters and personal encounters with family friends had the same personal encounters with levels of racism levels of hate you know i never seen um blatant you know unabridged you know bolstered hate that i've seen i've never seen the proud boys like i, I read about the kkk and and I, i've heard that they existed but i've never seen them outside like i was seeing in the last eight years you know, and unfortunately, when you create that level of hate, when you foster that, when you talk about beating up protesters and when you when you talk about when you um when you you um incite the insurrection, you know, when you constantly talk about violence and when you talk about the pe police should be able to do what they want to people, when you create that energy. They'll say they never said police should be able to do whatever they want. You, well, when you're saying that they have when they, you, when they should they have immunity. But that means that if, if you're immunity, then, then you can then that means you can kill, hurt, or do whatever with, to someone with impunity. So this is the reality. Of what this is this is the energy. I've watched Donald Trump sit there and say, "Yeah, you should punch him a little harder, get him off the stage. Yeah, just rough him up a little bit." Like I've literally watched him say these things. These this is not what I think he said. You know, these are things that we watch. So the energy that he, him and MAGA has created over the eight years led to this. And, and the reality is you don't want to see anybody get shot. You don't want anybody to be harmed. But you cannot ignore that when someone creates an energy and it comes back to them, the, the how it started and where it comes from. You know, and, and, and I don't, what I don't get is how people don't get that. You know, I've, I've and, and millions of people, I mean, hundreds of people on my page talking about, oh, what are you talking about? You, what are you talking about? Trump's never done any of this. This is not, and, and, and it's like, I'm trying to figure out, am I in the twilight zone? Because I don't know where someone has to be to not be able to see what the climate is. I say this all the time. Every Trump supporter is not a racist, right? But every racist is a Trump supporter. You can't explain to me how all the races follow one person that you're saying is unifying us, but they don't follow anybody else. You can't you can't act like when Obama was president, he was and Trump wasn't even a candidate that the level of racism and division that he caused during Obama's presidency wasn't crazy. You can't say that he didn't try to create a, a climate to actually have Obama hurt. You he questioned the man's. Um, legitimacy. He questioned everything about, and this was a black candidate. And he ran as a opposition as a result, you know, 
to Obama's presidency. Coming president, yeah. The whole MAGA campaign was saying, "Yo, y'all really let a black man run this country, and we're right. going to we're going to change that shit. We're not going to allow shit like that to happen again." It, it was, was, it was you know, it was a backlash. So if if you if people are, are blind to that, if you if you sit there trying to act like you don't realize that, you know, that I don't know what what you're watching. Yeah. I don't know what part of you know the the the, the show that you tuned into. But this is this has been the rhetoric, and, and I can say it's been for over eight years because he, like I said, he did it during Obama's presidency. I was just gonna say I agree with you 100 percent I mean, anybody who's acting like they don't know, either they're dumb or they're just trying to act like they're dumb. We know Donald Trump has said the most inciting things ever. Like some of the stuff that he says. People are like, oh, my God, I can't believe it. And in fact, some of the very people who probably are telling you that he didn't, you know, he hasn't, um, he didn't do anything to deserve to be shot, which he didn't. We're not going to, we're not going to say that he deserved to be shot. Oh, no, I, I didn't say that. I didn't say, oh, I know you didn't say that. I'm just saying, didn't, 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 but, but, but at the end of the day, at the end of the day, those same people will be like, oh, he just did some mean tweets. It's just mean tweets. So if you know about the mean tweets, what we've been saying is we didn't consider them to be mean tweets. We consider them to be dangerous tweets. So and you're those, using the word yeah. mean. We're saying they were dangerous and that that was our issue in the first place, okay? When he told the police officers, like you said, you know, when you pick them up, rough them up, you know, put them in the car, bang them up a little bit. This is what he said. So of course that that he's giving people a boldness. You and 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 at the end of the day, my son, let's get to the simple facts so that we can stop going rigging around the rosy. The man led an insurrection against the country, the government. The man had people that he knew he was sitting in his office in the White House and they were begging him to call and make a tweet, do something to stop people from running up and down the side of the Capitol, from running inside the building, chasing Nancy, looking for Nancy Pelosi, uh, going into the office of these folks, pooping on their desk, taking their equipment, going to looking for chasing Mike Pence. Somebody got killed. I mean, all of this happened under Donald Trump. And he's the one that said, we're going to walk down here. He, he, this, these were his words. He led the people. He led the people. And Clarence Thomas, who is uh, 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 on the Supreme Court, he votes against everything, everything, almost everything that we consider to be progressive, uh, you know, policy and or law that needs, that we need for our communities. Okay. He has been an adversary for a long time. His wife helped to pay for the insurrection. So I'm just saying like when people sit there and try to act like they have not created this environment, it's crap. Not to mention Let's just talk about the Central Park Five and then I'm done, okay? Donald Trump took a full page ad out against young boys who did not commit the crime that they were accused of, that they went to prison for, for years, okay? When asked about it recently, after he knew that those young men or those men now had been cleared, he still doubled down and did not say, well, you know, I apologize or, you know, this, I was misinformed or misled, right? Which is what you would think that somebody who's not trying to incite violence, who is this, you know, stellar uh, individual that people keep trying to say, because that's the one thing about us. We don't sit up here and say that, that Joe Biden is this great individual who's done, like that's some people who do that, but we don't do that, right? So Donald Trump ain't shit. So say that. <laughs> And then when you say that, then you could say, but I still fuck with him on, I rock with him on this policy, that policy, this thing. That thing. Yeah, give me a policy. And I respect that. If you give me a policy that you telling me that this benefits me, I don't really fuck with him. I can acknowledge all the bullshit he's done, but I still, uh, this policy right here is going to benefit me in my life. And so that's why, and I think everything else is 
is is irrelevant to me. I can respect that. For somebody to say that this right here, that Joe Biden is saying this, was trying to tell people to kill or shoot Trump. Uh, he said, he said, I have a job, and that's to beat Donald Trump. I'm absolutely certain I'm the best person to be able to do that. So we're done talking about the debate. It's time to put Trump in the bullseye. And they said that meant to shoot him. Let me get this straight. A Republican kid heard Joe Biden, the Democratic president, say that and then said, well, I'm going to be the one to go do it for you. Yeah, okay. Beat him in an election. I got none, of the, none of the shit that Trump been saying about literal violence, speaking on violence and, and saying that violence should happen and saying do it a little harder and saying that, you know, all these things that, that pertaining to the exact violence that was going on, he didn't really mean it. It was just it mean tweets, as you said. Like, we just got to stop the bullshit, man. At some point, bullshit got to stop. And with that, we've come to the end of another episode of TMI. We appreciate y'all. Make sure that y'all tune in every week. Make sure that you follow us, TMI underscore show. Let us know who you want to see on the show. Let us know topics, everything. Tell us that you love us. Tell us that you hate us. That you're keeping us number one. That we the best show that you ever seen, ever. We appreciate being number one. Thank you very much for supporting us. I'm not going to always be right. Tamika's not going to always be wrong, but we will both always, and I mean always, be authentic. That's how we own it. 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 Check out the video version of TMI. Every single Wednesday on iWoman.tv. That's how we own it.